1 Corinthians 15, and we're going to begin reading in verse 51. Uh, 1 Corinthians 15, uh, beginning in verse 51. The Bible says, Behold, I shew, a, I shew you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump. For the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O death, uh, O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God that ever that giveth us victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you and we praise you for the opportunity to meet with your people here at Dover one more time this side of eternity. God, we pray that we would be a faithful people uh, found to you here, Lord, that you would stir up interest in the community where we live, uh, Lord, by your faithfulness. Lord, we pray that we would be faithful and given a testimony for you. We pray now that you would bless your people with your word and we'd be faithful to praise you for it. For it's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. Now, some familiar verses of Scripture this morning, and uh, Paul closing out his first letter to the Corinthian church, and he had been somewhat scathing in his letter. He would pointed out some very critical problems with the church at Corinth, and to the best that we understand, they got them straightened out. Now, the problem in the modern day when the Lord speaks to many New Testament churches, instead of getting it right, they compromise. But uh, Corinth wasn't geared that way, and at, this, at the ending of this difficult letter, he begins then to talk to them about the victory in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, there's two themes to this. The first one is rising in Christ. If you're dead, this body will be uh, made new again. And then the other is this body changing, and both is a victory. Now, only you yourself this morning can answer, do you live in victory or do you live in defeat? Now, just because you're saved don't mean you live in victory. Right. Because remember, remember the church he's talking to. A uh, very sinful, ungodly church had a man running around with his stepmother. I, I don't think you can get much more bad than that. And, and so he begins to describe... A place of victory. Now, the devil knows that he cannot harm your salvation. And you say, well, Brother Larry, how do you know that? Well, I know that this because the devil's invitation, listen, first of all, the devil had nothing to do with the crucifixion of Christ. If you've been told that, you've been sold a bill of, a bill of goods. That was the plan of the Almighty. And you remember, if anything, the sinful request that the devil made through the Jews and the devil made through the Romans come down from the cross. And the reason why, because once, once the sacrifice was done, sin was defeated. And that is the last thing that Satan wanted. And, and so as we're looking at this, uh, he can't harm our salvation. He knows his limitations. But yet still, he can give you a miserable life while you're here. Yeah. Uh, I, I have a, I had a dear friend. He's gone home to be with the Lord now. And there's no need to mention his name, but just a good, 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 faithful brother. And he married a Campbellite woman when he was in his teens. And he had the most miserable life until she died. Now, was he rejoicing when she died? No. I'm sure he loved that woman. Or he wouldn't have married her. But you see what I'm saying? He didn't live in victory. Or at least not as much as he could have. And, and so living in victory, and Sovereign Gracers don't like to hear this, 
living in victory is a choice, <laughs> right? Do we have a choice in redemption? Certainly not. Do we have choice in living the way we live? Yes, we do. So do you live in victory? Do you live in happiness? Or do you live in defeat and misery? Uh, and you know what? Uh, we live in the South, and we know how to portray a good show, and, and no one really knows when you get down to it but you. Do you live in victory? And, and, and we need to. I tell you what, we live in a, in a really, really bad day. Brother Eric mentioned the state of our nation and asked for prayer in that direction and for our leaders. And you know what? If you look at that, what it will do is steal your victory. You know what? If you, re, if you sincerely study the end time prophecy, the United States has nothing to do with end time prophecy. Does that mean it has to go out of existence? Maybe. But it's certainly not critical to it. You, you know, I really believe this. Why, why was the states risen up the way they were? To finance the gospel. We were a very rich nation, and for many, many years, we sent missionary after missionary after missionary after missionary. But you know what? When an old person uh, completes their task, what happens? They die. Exactly right. And nations come and go. They rise and they fall. And so as we look at this, do you want to be made miserable by circumstance? Because certainly that's a possibility. I know a lot of people that have lived a miserable life just because they chose to. That's sad, is it not? That, 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 that's, a, that's, a, that's a horrible situation, especially for someone who knows they've been born again. So looking at that and going back to verse 51, uh, Paul writes, Behold, I shew you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. Now, what a glorious thing, and, and, and this was written close to 2,000 years ago. Uh, time of Paul was about 70 years after the time of Christ, so uh, in, in, in 2070, which it's crazy, but that's really not that far off in the future anymore. Uh, this will be 2,000 years ago. In that time, they were already looking for the coming of Christ. And how much closer today? He says, listen, some of us are going to be changed. You ever think about <clears throat> why do I have to face death? What, what, why is that there? Well, because you've got to be changed. That's why you have to face death. That, that, that is the necessity. You know, a lot of people put a lot of thought into death. And, you know, when Mother died, she had all the songs that she wanted sung at her funeral and, and, all, and, and everything. Literally, all James and I had to do is go sign something. And that, that's all we did. And, you know, uh, it was fine. It, it was pretty much a traditional Southern funeral. But, you know, if you can get into funerals, Donna's Aunt Desi, that is, uh, was, Brother Junior's sister-in-law, most simplistic, beautiful funeral I've ever been to. She was buried the next morning after she died. We all met at the cemetery. She wasn't, uh, she wasn't embalmed. Her pastor came. There's a few words said at the graveside. We sang a couple of songs. Beautiful, early part of the morning, and it was done. You know, but does that really matter? And the answer is no. Because you know what? What matters in what is important is how it's going to be changed. Yeah. Now, lost people, listen to me. Think about the rich man. He had some things still intact, didn't he? Mm -hmm. he? He could still feel, according to the Word of God, he said, I'm tormented in this flame. So he had sensation still intact. He had his memory. Right. He could remember what he's doing. Go tell my brethren. He, he remembered that... Uh, <laughs> that the poor man, Lazarus, was a slave. Go have Lazarus, Lazarus bring me something to drink. All that was intact. Can you imagine experiencing 
hell with an intact person and an intact memory. That's hell. That, that's what it will be like. And, and so we see for us to enter into glory, what we have to have is a new body and a new spirit, and God grants both to the redeemed. So he says, Behold, I shew you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. Now, I want uh, you to notice two things. And uh, uh, it says, In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, and, and the twinkling of an eye is a split second. I mean, you, you, you've seen your eyes blink very quickly. Maybe something's in them or something like that. Or just the sun comes up. But I, I, I read both terms and uh, a twinkle is less than a second. A moment, according to the King James translation, is 90 seconds. And I thought that was very unusual what this transformation is going to be about. I, you know, I, I don't know what it's, I just know that we're going to put on something that's matching to the inner man if you're saved. The new body, uh, a couple of things I know about it from the Word of God, the Bible says there'll be ne neither male nor female, so gender is not going to be a thing. And the other thing, <laughs> it'll match our spirit. <laughs> it, it, it will be clean and white and beautiful. And so when we get there, uh, you'll be consumed by the person of Christ. You know, uh, I've heard people say, and from when I was this big, I want to be by mother's grave. Well, uh, you, you ain't thinking right because, listen, uh, I love my mother dearly, but you know where I want to be? I want to be at the feet of Jesus. And you know what? With a new, with a new spirit and a new body, best I can understand, that's exactly where I'll be because I'll no longer be troubled by all this stuff. That is, the, that is the new body and the new spirit that Paul is writing of to this church. Uh, verse 53, for this corruptible, meaning this flesh, this sinfulness, for this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. That's, that, that is enjoying you have to have a never-ending being, both spiritual and fleshly, to enjoy the kingdom of, uh, of God. So, when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. Now, how many, and all of us have had loved ones pass away, how many people on that day considered it a victory? I would say it would be few and far between. Maybe in a moment, if we look at it in a spiritual sense, like, yes. Uh, the morning mother died, I was on my way to the hospital, and she died before I got off on the mill road. And... Uh, Donna called me and said, Jim's gone. And, uh, you know, I'm going to be honest. I mean, it, it just, it hit home. And uh, I didn't rejoice at first. Didn't know if I should rejoice. I didn't know what her spiritual condition was, to be honest. <laughs> I don't know mine all the time, and so how do you expect to know somebody else's? But you know what I immediately saw? how this is going to impact me. Uh, I wasn't, I didn't think of it as a victory. You see what I'm saying? Now a little bit down the road and I, I, I went on down there to see your body and to make arrangements for the funeral home and I got to thinking, uh, at least she's not suffering. Her last year was just misery. And it was very, very hard to watch. So I think at least, at least she's not suffering through that anymore. Mm -hmm. And she said she was a saved woman. She said she got saved in a tent revival, a Baptist tent revival done at Carlisle. And uh, that's all I can go by. So she was saved. What a blessing that is. A lot better off than I am, right? 
But how do you how do you perceive death? How do you look at death when it comes your way? Now, a lot of people fear it. I, I don't fear death. I really don't. Uh, I'm not excited about it, and I certainly don't want to suffer. But you know what? If that's the Lord's plan for me, I hope I do it well. Remember, Paul said that he about his vision. He said, three times I besought the Lord. And the Lord never took it from him. So you know what? Paul became all right with it. And so as we think about the reality of death, do you look at it as a defeat? Or do you look at it as a, look at it as a victory? Now, if you've been born again, I will assure you, sometimes it's very hard, and people that you love dearly and have been a portion of your life for all your life is very, very difficult. But if they've been born again, it's a time of victory according to this. Verse 55, O death, where is thy sting? You know what? I, I've seen deaths that look pretty rough. Just be honest, as a nurse, I, I, I've seen it both ways. Uh, I've seen people die in pain. And I've seen people just slip away. Mm -hmm. and, and it's a lot easier to watch them go easy. So when he's asking about the sting of death, is there a sting of death? I think there is. I fooled with my bees yesterday. Guess what? I didn't get stung. Mm -hmm. I anticipated it. I really did. I thought this is my, my first time you ride a horse. Uh, but it didn't happen. What does a sting do? You feel it for a moment. It hurts. And it kind of goes away. Right? Yeah. You know, at the very worst, you might get a red spot and it lasts a day or so. But the sting is really brief, is it not? It's there and it's gone. What is the sting of death? Well, I think I just described to you yet about mother. It was knowing that she would no longer be there. She's the only person I've known for 55 years. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? That's a sting. But then you think about the goodness of the Lord and, and, and what he got her out of, and then you can see that it is a very brief thing. The sting of death is short. Verse 57, But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. And then with this, with this overwhelming power to dread death and this overwhelming power sometime to dread tomorrow, <laughs> we find there should be victory. You know what? If, I, if I'm able to get up and go in the morning, I'm heading south to Erin and, and, and popping in there and do the very best job I can. Now, the Bible says having to do that in and of itself is the curse of Adam. But you know what? I'm not going to let it be a sting. A bunch of old people down there. I might be able to share the gospel with them. Uh, I, might, I might be able uh, to speak to one of the employees about the eternity of this life, whether in hell or here. See, I can make it a misery and think about that stupid computer. This is how ridiculous nursing has got. I don't have one computer on my desk. I have two. One over here and one over here. That's, that's modern day stuff. And I can say, I sure do dread looking at those two stupid computers all day tomorrow. Or I can say, Lord, use me where I'm at. You, you think you're where you're at this morning by accident? Do we believe God's sovereign or do we not? My little grandson is in Vanderbilt. I pray for his health every day, but the only thing I can take it is that AJ and Sarah are in the place that was foreordained for him, for them this day. And you know why I believe that? Because God's sovereign. So, and Sarah's not like that, but she can get up there and have the boo-hoos, and uh, AJ can have a fit and turn the hospital on its edge, or they can make it what it, make it <laughs> a victory. 
Make it a day of pleasantness. Make it a day, make it a day where they live in victory. So <laughs> sometimes it's easy and sometimes it's not. Now go with me back to Acts chapter 6. And, and we'll see this kind of applied to the life of Stephen and then we'll be done. Acts chapter 6 in the first verse. Acts chapter 6 in the first verse. And it says, and in those days, and if you know your Bible, that means the church was increasing. Uh, they had a wonderful revival on the day of Pentecost. They had had some opposition in chapter 3. And uh, uh, we see when Paul said, I mean, Peter said, silver and gold have I none, but such as I have, give I thee. And there was a great revival that came out of that event. Now, in this part, we see another event occurring. Also in 5, you will see Ananias and Sapphira, what happened with them. Don't lie to the Holy Ghost. And so in verse 6, he says, excuse me, chapter 6, the first verse, and in those days when all that victory was coming, the number of the disciples was multiplied, and there arose a murmuring of, a murmuring of the Grecians against the Hebrews because their widows were, nected, uh, were neglected in the daily menstruation. Uh, now, I find this, uh, I find this little interesting. First of all, you had a church both of Gentiles and Jews together. Uh, and so uh, two different cultural groups, a group that believed at one time they were the only people of God, and Greeks were, had so many gods you couldn't even number them. Remember when, when Paul went into that place and says, here you have a, here you have a statue to the unknown God, and, and that's the only one you know about. So we had two cross cultures that were coming together, and no doubt there were going to be problems when that occurs. But I want you to see the problem was this, that the Grecians, the Greeks, were critical of the Jews concerning their widows. Now, I find that interesting because it was addressed in the law. Uh, remember, uh, it, said, it said that the family was to take care of the widow, and uh, in fact, it, it would fall to the eldest son. And remember when Jesus was crucified, what did he do with Mary? He gave her to John. And he said, behold thy mother. In other words, you take on her responsibility. The best, I believe, by this point, uh, Joseph, his father, was dead, and it was his responsibility to care for Mary. And so he passed that. He wasn't passing the buck. He was, he was giving that authority to somehow, someone else because he, he knew what the law said, and he was a keeper of the law. And, and so we find here that the, the criticism I find strange coming for a, from a group that really had a law saying you take care of them. And so this became an issue. Verse 12, uh, verse 2, excuse me. And the twelve, meaning the apostles, called the multitude of the disciples, all the church, unto them. And it was not, and, it, and said, it is not reason that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Therefore, brethren, look ye out among you seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. Now, uh, let me uh, say one quick interjection here. First of all, we're in the apostolic days, those days from the ascension of Christ to all those that were literally had seen Jesus in the flesh died, that whole, and, and probably up to even maybe 100, 110 years. And so in that time, he, 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 he makes this statement, he, uh, you, you, you choose these out. We, we have to tend to the Word of God, and you choose out seven others. Now, a lot of people want to take this out of context. And listen, if a man of God has a true Baptist church that's thriving, and they can support him full-time, good. But it is not a requirement. This is apostolic. And I, I've seen I've seen a lot of those verses take. See, if we're to study, we're to be full time. No, you're, you're taking that out of context. And, and so we see that first of all. And then they take them and said, 
you need to pull some people out and their job is to wait tables and to wash dishes. Now, our, our young people down up back there, uh, our young Andersons, you want to be an apostle? <laughs> right? Now, I, I've never waited tables except for my children, and I haven't done a lot of that. One day, uh, I was on Facebook, and uh, I have a teacher from elementary school that I have friends on Facebook. Mother took care of her mother when her mother was ill. And so we got to be really close. And it was this thing on Facebook, and you had to list these things, everything you've done, and one thing was something you hadn't actually done. And the one I hadn't done was a waiter. And, uh, and uh, Miss Chloe literally put laugh out loud beside of the waiter. And she says, you couldn't do this if you tried. So Madison, I have respect for you. And, uh, but that was the ministry. You know what? There's very few people today that want a service ministry. They want to be the big Billy Graham of the Sovereign Grace churches. They don't want to be somebody that mops the floor or uses the vacuum or, or wipes the windows down. They want to be at the very top. You know what I have found from 30 years of ministry? That's usually not how it goes. They want to be... But we find a different spirit in Stephen. Now, let, let's read the, the seven of these gentlemen that are named these brothers in Christ, and we'll see that Stephen, at least to me, well, I'm, I take that back, Philip is there too, but only two of these uh, do I know about in the rest of the Word of God. Verse 5, And the saying pleased the whole multitude, the whole church, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and the Holy Ghost. Now, I think that that is noteworthy, that a man that literally says full of faith, full of, it doesn't say the faith, meaning the oracles and principles given to God's church, it says faith, just believing that God's able and that he will, full of faith and the Holy Ghost. They chose him. Now, I don't know who you would pick from, from our group. I'll just use Jared as an aside because he is, he's full of the faith. He knows more or as much about the Bible than I do. And you know what? I believe Jared would very willingly wait tables. I don't think it would be an issue for him at all. And so this man that has a very un, has a very unique, close position of the God yielded to himself to whatever. Now, I believe we live in a day and age where we're not willing to yield ourselves to whatever. We only want certain things. So this man, Stephen, was an unusual, faithful man. And what was his job? Waiting tables. Uh, taking, taking food to other people. Then it says, the rest of them, and Philip, which Philip is mentioned again, and, Pro, and, and Procurus, and Nicanor, and Timon, and uh, Paramenus, and Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch. And so all those individuals were chose, and their ministry was to wait tables. Now, one of your problems with living in victory may just be that you're not satisfied with the ministry that you've been given. Now, believe it or not, I've been called to other churches. And some of them were much larger churches than New Testament. But I knew that this is where I needed to be. Was it waiting tables? Well, I've cleaned a few up. I ain't much on waiting them. But the uh, other day at the house, Donna asked me yesterday, I cleaned up the uh, table because all them youngins have been playing on it with and it had one of those plastic tablecloths on it like you women use here. And I started folding it in and folding it forward. And that woman said, you've done this before. And I said, yes, ma'am, I've done this before. And you know what? No matter what it is, you do it like you mean business with God. If it is folding up a dirty tablecloth. And, and, and so we find in this 
that Stephen wasn't embarrassed. He wasn't upset. He, he, he didn't avoid it, but rather he was glad to do it. Verse 6, and when they set before the apostles, whom they set before the apostles, and when they had prayed, and they laid their hands on them, and the word of God increased. So I want you to see in verse 6, they were ordaining them to that ministry. And the word of God increased, and the number of the disciples multiplied in Jerusalem greatly, and a great company of priests were obedient to the faith. So I want you to see in this discreet place where Stephen and Philip and the others were doing an unseen job, God was blessing the preaching of the Word of God. You know what? For Stephen and Philip and the others, I hope there was victory in something very, very simple. Now, again, a lot of what steals our victory in the modern day is wanting to be on top of something. When maybe all we, all our ministry is, is to straighten the pews. All our ministry is, is to show up. <laughs> right? And, and, and we need to do that not with glum, but with happiness, with gladness, with joy. Because if we do that, then we certainly live in victory. And if not, you will be a people most miserable, is what the Bible says. And so we need to get in a position to be happy where we're at, to be thrilled where we're at, and live in the victory. Verse 8. And Stephen... Full of faith and power, that's the second time it's been noted that Stephen, first of all, had enough faith in God that it impacted his life. Stephen, full of faith and power, did great wonders and miracles among the people. So I want you, I want you to see, because he was faithful to serve in tables, that God began to use him in a great and mighty way. Listen, we're not going to begin at the very top. You know what? He's going to see how we use what we have. I had been preaching at every opportunity I could, and I was in the ministry probably four years before we went to um, South Road Baptist Church. And you know what? It was a church, I guess it was smaller than this one. I'm trying to remember. It was mostly one family, the Taylors, and they're all about gone now. And, uh, that, and there was one other family that didn't like me much. And that was it. So I could have went down there and had the boo-hoos, or I could have gone down there like we do, even when we're serving tables, do it as unto the Lord. It's what the Bible says. And you know what? What a great and glorious thing. You know what? Mary got excited about serving Jesus' table, and she got so excited she cleaned up his feet that is serving him in victory. That is serving him like you mean it. Verse 9. Then there arose certain of the synagogue, which is called uh, the synagogue of the Libertarians, and the Cyrenians, and the Alexandrians, and of them of Thessalonica uh, and Asia, disputing with Stephen. Now, just know this. When you're living in victory, trouble's coming. If you're satisfied with mopping the floor, you know what? Somebody's going to spill a sweet Coke, right? Maybe right after you get done with it, and you have to go back and say, uh, believe me, uh, we're, we're in nature not that happy. Can you imagine ladies saying, oh, good. Larry spilled a Coke. I'm going to go back over. This give me an opportunity to do a little bit more. Right? Well, we're just not like that. But Stephen served tables, and then the Lord used him more, and now he meets the opposition. Expect it. It's going to happen. And so he didn't get, the, he didn't get angry. He didn't get mad. He, he, he continued to live in victory. And now he had to face off with the, with the adversary. Uh, verse 10. And uh, 
And they were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit of which he spake. And then they suburned me and he said, we have heard uh, him speak blasphemous words against Moses and against God. Then you know that they begin to stir him up uh, and stir up the crowds against him. Yeah. Now go with me to chapter 7 now, and we're nearing the end. He has a very long discussion with him. He will not compromise the truth. In verse 51, Acts 7, verse 51, he says, You stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, do you always resist the Holy Ghost as your father did, fathers did, so do ye. Now that, he, he told them exactly about their condition. Uh, he, wasn't, he, he wasn't being vindicted. He was telling them the truth. See, men of God, women of God, uh, when you tell the truth, expect problems. It's living in victory, but expect problems from the world. People are not going to quiet. Listen, we live in a day and age today where people are supposedly able to choose their gender, and we're going to speak that men is men and women are women. You think you're going to get applauded for that? No. Oh. Living in victory doesn't mean you're going to live in happiness. You see what I'm saying? Victory is something that the Lord gives. It doesn't mean you'll live without, you'll be happy under the Lord, but you may be hated by the world. Which of the prophets have not your fathers persecuted? And they have slain them, and which shewed them of the coming of the just one, of whom you have been now the betrayers and the murderers, whom who have received the law by the depositions of angels and have not kept it. When they heard these things, they were cut to their heart and they gnashed on him with their teeth. Now, I want you to see two things. First of all, being victorious means telling the truth. Now, a couple of things about the results. Being gnashed on with their teeth. Now, the... Uh, Jews had one thing they would do, like kind of click their jaw, like that. But I don't believe that's what it's re uh, referring to here. I literally believe they bit him. That's living in victory. That's living, so nothing but Christ comes first. That is living fully the way the Lord would have us to have us to live and to die in, in the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 56, uh, verse 55, And he, being full of the Holy Ghost, looked up steadfastly into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing on the right hand of God and said, Behold, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. And they cried out with a loud voice, and stopped their ears and ran upon him with one accord. Have you ever had a section of scripture that kind of gigged you and you stopped your ears up to it? I think we've all had some of those down through the years, don't you? Uh, some, some issues. And you know what? First of all, if you want to live in victory, accept what the Word of God says. And, and one thing about accepting the Word of God, you don't have to understand it to accept it. You say, oh, I want a reason. Just, just believe it. I know two and two is four. I don't need a reason, right? That's what it is. And, and the very, the, on the very same token... If it says come out from among them and be you separate, I don't have to know, I don't need to know why that is my command. I just need to do it. And, and, and so we find with this situation that uh, they had to stop their ears up to the truth so they wouldn't hear it. Verse 58, and they cast him out of the city and stoned him and stoned him, and the witnesses laid down their clothes at a young man's feet, whose name was Saul. And they stoned Stephen, calling upon God and saying, Lord Jesus, 
receive my spirit. Can you imagine dying in that victory? Lord, receive my spirit and, and be gone in a moment. Be home to be with the Lord. You ever thought about when you're dying in victory, what your last words may be? You know, I believe that's one reason we're to choose our words wisely. And I don't a whole lot. You don't know when it's going to be the last words you say. Now, we think that we're going to face a sick bed and, and, and be down for a couple of years. And, but the, the truth is, you just don't know that. So when we, we use this thing, remember, it, it could be the last ones you say. So let it be used of the Lord. And, and so as Stephen's dying, he said, I see the Lord Jesus Christ. I see him above us. Verse 60. And he kneeled down and cried with a loud voice, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. Now, you talk about a victorious death. Can you imagine a group of people that had literally just stopped up their ears and, and Nash bit him and he's saying, Lord, forgive them. Lay not this sin to their charge. You know, I, I remember someone else not doing that, don't you? The Lord Jesus Christ. That's right. Interesting. See, that's, that's a death in victory. So today, do you live in victory or do you live in defeat? Are you happy? That our Lord Jesus is still on his throne. The Bible says he worketh everything after the counsel of his own will. And all is well. Or do you live in defeat? Oh, what's going to happen next? You know, I don't know. I'll say, let me interject this. Let's give you something to praise the Lord. No, I'm kidding. But I saw Pelosi on Facebook yesterday. She's in a wheelchair. You think that's by accident? I feel sorry for the woman. I hope she's a saved woman, but you don't ride a wheelchair just because you want to. So we see uh, we need to live in victory now. Don't, don't wait on the Lord's blessing to live in victory. Live in victory now, and who knows what the Lord will do. Now, you may end up like Stephen, or you may be the one that we first read about it says we shall all we will all be changed. We'll be called up. I don't know which one I'm going to be in, but either way, I'm glad. Right? Are you living in victory?